Good morning. Chair Lieber. Here. Vice Chair Gaines. Here. Member uh, Vasquez is not present. Member Schaefer. Present. Deputy Controller Emron. Present. Thank you. Um, members, uh, a quorum is present and the board meeting is called to order. Uh, we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Mr. Emron. If everyone would please stand. Um, we'll go first to our um, members' brief opening remarks. Uh, do any members have remarks that they'd like to make this morning? Mr. Schaefer. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, today is the first day of spring. That's important. <clears throat> it's also the birthday of William Jennings Bryan, who was very famous for having three times run for president of the United States at age 36. It's also the birthday of John DeLorean, who invented one of the most remarkable cars that we've ever seen in the movie Back to the Future. And Clayton Kershaw turns 35 today, the famous Dodger. So there's a lot going for us. And there's one memory we have for birthdays this month. Next Monday, me, I'm gonna be 86. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Mr. Emron. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning to everyone and to those viewing online. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to extend my best wishes to the Muslim community across California and the world in uh, observing the holy month of Ramadan. For the nearly two billion Muslims worldwide, Ramadan is a sacred month of reflecting on peace and charity, forgiveness, and the ever so important responsibility we have as humans to serve one another and help those less fortunate. It's also a very special time of year that brings some of the best dishes and desserts to the table as families and communities gather for iftar and to break fast together. So as Muslim Americans, we celebrate this holy month. I am reminded we are one California family sharing in the dream of religious freedoms for all. So let's continue to stand up and speak out against bigotry and hate and persecution. No person in California should ever live in fear for practicing their religion or their appearance. The controller and I both stand committed in safeguarding the civil rights of all Californians so to all those celebrating, may God's peace be with you. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emran. Mr. Vasquez, did you have any opening comments that you'd like to make? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at the risk of repeating some of the things that I know my colleagues have already said, let me just start with, uh, I'd like to recognize, obviously, National Women's Month and observance in March but to really single out one that really stands out in my mind uh, as we look at women, and especially a senior woman, a good longtime friend, Dolores Huerta, you know, she, here she is 93 years old and so active. I mean, she came to our swearing in both times and has been real active in a lot of the labor movement still at her age. And I always joke with her, I said, I hope I could walk when I'm 90, much less be active like her. So I'd just like to acknowledge her also for working with the workers' uh, rights for bettering our environment, the advocacy work on immigrants for women's rights, her 15 honorary doctorate degrees and countless awards for her community service and advocacy barely scratched the surface. Doris has been, been and still is dedicating her whole life to making this a better place for all Californians. And then also attached to that, I look at uh, you know, March, it just not only is it the International Women's Day, but it happens to be the end of the month is also the birthday of, of, of our great Cesar Chavez, who was one of the partners with her that started the whole movement with the United Farm Workers. Uh, we lost him some years back, but just wanted to recognize him as well. And as I think about all the great women that have participated and have contributed to uh, not only our democracy but to the betterment of our, the state of California. One that jumps out at me in my district, uh, and we lost uh, just recently, 
was the Gloria Molina who started up here on the assembly, then was on the city council in LA and then uh, ended her career as a, one of the board of supervisors in LA County for her dedication and contributions uh, <clears throat> along with several others. Uh, you know, we've had some really powerful women mayors like in Monterey Park, I'm thinking of Lily Lee Chen, uh, former mayor of Monterey Park and <clears throat> others throughout the county. But with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you so much. Mr. Gaines, did you yeah. wanna? Yeah. Thank you, I just um, wanted to give a little bit of an update. I, um, over the last couple of weeks, I've had a chance to visit a couple of my county assessors and I've got 34 <laughs> and you, you have a lot too, Sally. Uh, so yeah. we've got our work cut out for us, but uh, I picked up five, I lost one county and picked up five new ones. So I'm trying to get out and meet the, the new ones. So I had the uh, honor of um, meeting with uh, Arnie Gross, assessor in Calusa County. And um, uh, his office is located in their old uh, courthouse. It was built in 1861. So it was pretty, um, and it's been renovated uh, in the last 20 years. But it was nice just to touch base with him. Uh, we uh, took some notes, too, of a few things that I'd like to, mm -hmm. to share um, in the weeks ahead uh, in terms of maybe how we can provide uh, better services at the BOE. But generally speaking, things are really, really good. Secondly, I met with uh, Glenn Zook in Solano County, and um, one of the bigger concerns they have is trying to just process all these land purchases, um, nearly 90 square miles for the billionaires that are buying up land in Solano, and they have this proposal to create a new city. I uh, just found that fascinating in terms of how does that all happen, will it happen? Mm -hmm. uh, but that was interesting. And then. Uh, this last week met with Assessor Jesse Salinas in Yolo County. Very impressed with, with him in terms of what he's done. He's not only the assessor, but um, uh, also the recorder and runs the elections department. So uh, he's got his hands full, but incredibly visionary. And um, he does an analysis of strength finders on every employee in that department and figures out what their strengths are and then puts them into the right spots. So thank you. That's great, yeah. thank you very much. And um, I too wanted to recognize uh, Women's History Month and acknowledge that uh, women's history uh, is still in formation and that in so many ways uh, American history is women's history because women have been and continue to be uh, the real backbone of our society. And uh, we are uh, an agency that is led by a woman of excellence, our own Yvette Stowers. And so we are a part of that history going forward. Um, and I also wanted to announce the appointment of my capable new chief deputy uh, for District 2, uh, Doug Winslow. And um, in recognizing him, I wanted to also thank uh, my outgoing uh, deputy, Gary Gartner, for over five years of service to the Board of Equalization. Uh, moments ago, uh, our own Mary Cicchetti had uh, administered the oath to uh, my new chief deputy, Doug Winslow, and I am very honored to have the chance to say a few words about him now. Doug has decades of experience working with hundreds of elected officials throughout California and in several other states. Uh, he has worked with county government and managed data files from each of California's 58 counties. Uh, he has more than 20 years of small business experience uh, running a small business that um, many of us uh, relied on for service. Uh, when I was first elected to the State Assembly in 2002, Doug served as my district director. So he's a, he's a veteran of a Libra administration in that way. <laughs> um, and I can really say that Doug has motivated me and has inspired uh, so many other elected officials, particularly the women uh, that he has helped to promote uh, for decades. 
Doug's personal life is very colorful and impressive as well. He manages a 40-acre ridgetop property in the Santa Cruz Mountains and cares for over 20 species of farm and rescued animals. Uh, he has raised miniature donkeys, peacocks, emu, and hatches ornamental pheasants. Uh, Doug has lived on his San Mateo County ranch producing all of his electricity from solar power for over 36 years. Uh, Doug has been a longtime advocate for our state's open meeting laws and has been diligently preparing for his appointment today. It's truly impressive, the study and the excitement that he has brought into coming into this position. So I am very excited and thankful to welcome Doug Winslow as my new chief deputy. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you for mentioning uh, uh, Gary, your retiring uh, chief. He served me ably for four years, as you know, and uh, uh, he did a lot of good for all of us, and I just want to commend him there. Also, I want to commend uh, our uh, uh, <coughs> executive director for publishing a very nice uh, <coughs> a volume this week on each and every one of our staffs so we can see that we each have two or three very able staff members and who they are and also importantly that we have a vacancy or two and, and just how we operate I think the better we're able to coordinate with each other and uh, Yvette did a very good job in putting that together at my request so thank you thank you so much now members um, yes Mr. Gaines yes uh, yeah Welcome, uh, Doug Winslow. I uh, wish you the best. And uh, I just also want to take an opportunity with Gary because I uh, we've worked with him for five years, and so I appreciate uh, what he did uh, serving you, Chair Lieber, uh, and and also uh, Mike. I um, I've just found I've enjoyed uh, working with him, and just I I hope he. Um, I, I'm not sure where he's he, he is, but I, I hope the best for him and that uh, he uh, has great opportunities in front of him. So uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and our first order of business today is our informational uh, announcement. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Cuddy. Okay. Good morning again, everyone. Our first order of business is our informational announcement. This meeting is live streamed to the public and posted on the BOE YouTube channel. Therefore, we ask that all speakers please state your name first before you begin speaking for the record. We ask that you speak clearly and slowly to the microphone. I would like to remind the audience to silence their cell phones and any other wireless devices. Note that public comment is taken on each agenda item the public will be invited to comment on matters before the board. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak before the board on any agenda item in person, we ask that you complete and submit to the Sergeant of Arms a public comment appearance sheet located at the entrance of the auditorium. If you wish to speak before the board by telephone, please dial the phone number and access code provided on the public agenda notice and follow the instructions of the AT&T moderator. If you intend to make a public comment today using the AT&T moderator, we recommend dialing in to the meeting on the teleconference line before your agenda item begins. Um, we recommend this as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay between the live stream and the live event. When giving public comments, please limit your remarks to three minutes. This concludes the informational announcement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, members, we're going to um, take item 10 under the board member um, matters. Uh, out, out of order because we do have a speaker here on that item, but I'd just like to briefly go through item one, the uh, public comment on matters that are not on the agenda. Uh, persons who wish to address the Board of Equalization regarding items not on the agenda may do so under this item. 
please note that the board cannot act uh, on items that are not on the agenda. However, the board can schedule issues raised by the public for consideration at our future meetings. Uh, if there's anyone providing public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. And we do not have uh, written public comments, uh, nor do we have anyone in the auditorium who would like to make live comments today. So let us go to our AT&T moderator. Uh, AT&T moderator, is there anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment on items not on the agenda under item one? Ladies and gentlemen, on the phone lines, if you wish to ask a question, please press one, then zero on your telephone keypad. Okay, I think it's safe to say that we can go ahead and close that mm -hmm. public comment. Mm -hmm. Then thank you, AT&T moderator. And we will um, go on to item 10. Uh, this is an item that was requested by our state controller. And so we'll go to our deputy state controller to announce the item and our speaker. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Ms. Lee, you can come on, come on down. Just wanna take a few moments to just thank you uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to appear before the board. Welcome back to the chambers. Um, members of the controller wanted to put this on the, the agenda today and get a briefing from Ms. Lee, who's uh, one of the heads of the Department of Finance, um, in order to get a good understanding of the budget. I know a lot has changed uh, over the course of a year from when you presented the last year, so I think it's important as an elected body to get a uh, briefing on, on the California state budget and seeing where we're at and what, what uh, lies ahead. So thank you so much, and without further ado, I want to welcome Ms. Erica Lee from the Department of Finance. Thank you. Um, good morning, um, Ch Madam Chair, Vice Chair Gaines, and board members. Thank you again for the invitation to come back here. It, it, it feels both longer than a year and, and shorter <laughs> based on the past 12 months. Uh, but thank you. I uh, appreciate the um, opportunity to speak about the 2024 governor's budget. Um, first, it's important to note that this budget was developed um, under a couple of extraordinary events. And the first one being the record surge in revenues that occurred from 2019-20 through 2021-22. So two years of record revenues. And just as an example, our big three tax revenues, um, which is PIT, CORP, and um, sales and use tax, um, grew by a record 55%, largely propelled by significant gains in the stock market. Um, while we in California are used to volatility, this was off the charts. Um, capital gains realizations increased to 11.6% of personal income, and just as uh, context, the average at that point was 5%, so 11.6%. Um, when the state experiences these high revenue increases, we naturally expect to have a decrease after that. Um, the question is always, how quickly that will occur. Um, and usually we have data points that help us with that forecast, um, which leads to our second extraordinary event, which was the IRS extending our tax filing date from April 15th to 1st October um, 16th, then to November 16th, um, in, in light of the storms that we had um, um, a little over a year ago. Now the data that we normally have in April, all, that tax, all the tax receipt data we use, um, our forecasters use to um, project what they think the revenue will be coming in the next year. We didn't have that data. Um, so we were a little bit flying blind when we were building that budget, of 2023 budget. We forecasted what we thought would be a decrease because that was what it was looking like. Um, so we got the direction correct, but the slope obviously very incorrect. And so um, fast forward to November, we had very little time to build the budget. We usually have much more time because we have the fall, um, but we didn't have all that information until after mid-November. Um, and the information that we would have had to build the 2023 budget, we then had to use to correct the 2023 budget. And so the, the governor's budget, um, uh, you will note at the time, we were projecting about a $38 billion deficit, and that was on top of a $31.7 billion deficit the prior year. So we have back-to-back -back deficits. Um, despite the revenue declines, I, I do want to point out something that's important is 
Um, we are not projecting a recession. And obviously the, the, the growth in the economy um, is a, a bit decoupled from our revenues. Our revenues have been going down. The economy, as you look across the country, has been, has been growing somewhat strong. Um, so we are not uh, anticipating a recession. We're actually seeing this as a correction of our revenues. And so because of the significant increase, Phones away. Yeah. Sorry. Um, because of that significant extraordinary event that I mentioned, that in the huge increase in revenues, um, it, it skewed people's expectation of what revenues are. But we're really going back to what it used to be prior to the pandemic. And specifically, we're about 23% higher than where we were in 2019. But it's very difficult to think that way because the, the past few years had been so high in regards to revenues. Um, but I, I think that's just an important point to make is we're not forecasting a recession. We are forecasting or we're seeing a correction in our revenues. Um, so the budget shortfall, as I mentioned, is about $38 billion. Um, and what we have to do is present solutions to the legislature to be considered um, so that we can build our budget um, come June and come to an agreement. But I think it's important also to note that this f this budget framework um, largely is about 291 billion in total funds, of which 208 billion is general fund, and total spending is actually less by about 20 billion in this budget than compared to last budget. So it's a reflection of the the, the reduction in the revenues. Um, we have proposed a mix of balanced solutions similar to what I explained last year. So there, I, I'll go through um, at a high level what those are. The first um, and biggest category is our reserves. So last year we did not touch our reserves. Um, that includes the budget stabilization account as well as the school um, reserves and um, uh, uh, we have a what we call a uh, kind of like our checking account, um, which we, we've built in. But in, in regards, the, the budget proposes about $13.1 billion in reserve solutions. Um, and the reason we left reserves untouched last year was because we didn't know what this year would look like. And this year is, is not looking good in terms of our revenues. And so we have tapped into those reserves. $12 billion is from our rainy day or the budget stabilization account. Um, and about $900 million in our safety net reserve. One important point to make is that we have about 18.4 billion left in reserves, so we can maintain budget resilience should we need that next year. The next big category is the reduction category or, or, or cuts, um, and this is about 8.5 billion. And again, at a high level, we have about 2.9 billion in climate-related reductions, about 1.6 billion in education program reductions, 1.2 billion in housing pr um, program reductions. Um, and we do have some proposed ongoing reductions in our CalWORKs program. The next big category is our delays. So we're, we're wanting to maintain doing these t programs, but we can't afford it this year. So we're pushing them off to uh, future years. Um, we have some delays in our transit program as well as in our climate and resources program. We do have some reduction, uh, sorry, delays in health and human services um, and, uh, and education infrastructure as examples. Um, we also have deferrals. Um, deferrals uh, are slightly different than delays here because legally for a deferral, and, and I'll explain why in a moment, um, these entities uh, can use the fact that we're deferring funds um, to borrow, and this is the UC and the CSU, the system. So last year we um, agreed, the administration with the, the systems, um, to fund them at 5% base increases over the next five years. Um, what we're doing is we are, we are maintaining that commitment, but we're gonna defer the actual payment to next year. And so that allows them, that deferral allows those systems to be able to go and to borrow internally from their uh, existing funds. Um, that's both the UC and the CSU. Um, we have another category of reductions, revenue and borrowing. Um, and I wanna just point out specifically the largest one, which is our increase in the managed uh, care organization tax. And so we um, are needing to go back to the federal government to ask for uh, an expansion of an already approved MCO tax. And that's another, it's 1.5 billion right there. Um, and then lastly, we have fund shifts. So we will be borrowing from 
specifically, and the largest fund is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, about $1.8 in various shifts from the general fund to that fund. So that concludes the, the broad framework of our budget. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, in light of this shortfall, the administration, this is sort of to catch you up to date because the governor's budget came out in January. A lot of things have been happening since then. We have asked the legislature to uh, consider early act acting early on some of these budget issues. We ideally would like um, eight billion worth of current year and prior, uh, sorry, prior year and current year um, reductions, delays, our solutions, as well as the MCO tax, which I mentioned is the 1.5 billion that's included in that eight billion. Um, and I'm um, pleased to say that last week I was testifying in, before the assembly. They took up the MCO, our MCO tax proposal. They um, voted it and uh, out of the floor yesterday and uh, the Senate is going to be hearing that bill today, so I'm actually going to run to that hearing after this. Um, but we, uh, you know, we uh, um, have appreciated the um, discussions that we've had with the legislature because this is obviously a significant um, shortfall that we have to address. Um, we are hoping to have an even bigger package than the MCO package, and so when the legislature goes on spring recess, when they come back, um, uh, our, our hope is to continue to have those discussions so that we can act early in some of these budget solutions. Um, so that those they don't erode and we lose some of those savings. Um, so with that, I'm happy to respond to any questions uh, of, of the board. Thank you. Questions, members? Mr. Schaefer. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee, uh, uh, do you, uh, you may have mentioned it. I, I didn't catch it. Uh, I, I'd like to reiterate what would be the percentage of our revenues from sales tax versus property tax. Um, the state doesn't receive property tax, so the big three are, um, are uh, personal income tax, corporate tax, and sales tax. Oh. Um, what happens at the local level is that the property taxes help um, fill the Prop 90, the education guarantee, and any of the property tax in a locale that doesn't meet the full amount of that bucket of education funding, then the general fund will go in. Um, so there's no property tax that actually comes yeah. to the state. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Mr. Vasquez. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Ms. Lee, for your presentation and update. I know last year when you were here, uh, you mentioned the cash reserves uh, to pay down long-term capital projects. I was just wondering, do we have enough this year coming out uh, on the cash reserve side? Um, so our our... our Cash receipts, I think, is that is that what you're talking about? Yes. So our cash is actually quite strong right now, and so that's another reason why I think we're not as concerned, uh, you know, uh, 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 about a, a recession. I shouldn't say we're not concerned about it, but that we we anticipate we're not anticipating a recession, and the idea of having strong cash uh, receipts reserves is important. Um, we have last year part of our um, solution did mean. Flipping, we propose flipping some of our capital cash projects to bonds, and that that's been maintained. And so those, um, we have largely flipped a lot of our cash projects to bonds. And then in the finance bulletin, I noticed uh, there was a decrease in our monthly cash receipts of 8.4% in December, and then in January it was a minus 19%. And that trend, I'm just wondering if that's going to continue, or is that, will that, I guess, trigger these cuts? Yeah, thank you. And that's some of, some of what we are doing. Every month, we do put out a finance bulletin, which right. is just as you say, it updates cash, the cash that's coming in. And um, the most recent one, actually, we will be um, submitting, releasing later today, um, which does show a 3% reduction um, in February based on a comparison of from governor's budget but you are correct over um, the year to date we are trending about 5.5 billion below our expected what we thought and that was at governor's budget so we had updated at governor's budget from the budget act but we are still seeing um, declines in revenues based on um, our monthly cash receipts. So yes, I would say that we are, um, that's sort of the update. We don't, we won't know. We have two big months where we get cash, right? January and then April. 
And so we're anticipating, and, and some months it's up, some months it's down. And so I would say that we are waiting until April um, to have the information that we normally need to build our forecast. But absolutely, that reduction in revenue has us concerned. And I think that's why we also want to move on early action so that we can make some of those, those decisions now. And if we need to at the mayor vision, which is the governor's update based on revenues, we might have to propose additional cuts and um, solutions. So yes, thank you for that question because it's absolutely something that we're concerned about. Yeah, it just kind of jumped out at me. But I appreciate the governor's uh, keeping his commitment, especially on the affordable housing front. You know, you know, every year we're falling further and further behind, and it sounds like he's going to try to hold a hard line on that and keep the funding coming, especially for those projects in the pipeline and those that are hopefully be coming forward this year. Yeah, and I would also add that we are looking um, for more accountability also from the locals to make sure that they're actually producing those affordable units. So both providing the funding, but also making sure that there's accountability on the back end so that they're actually being built. No, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gaines. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Deputy Director Lee. I appreciate your presentation very much. And uh, I've got a question similar uh, to what uh, Member Vasquez was mentioning in terms of uh, do you think we're going to be suffering from permanent reduced revenue? Because, uh, you know, we hear stories mm -hmm. about businesses moving out of the state of California and if those are there's been so much success in technology and if, if some of those technology companies are moving out and then they're going public then you're seeing that reduction on the personal income tax side mm -hmm. too right um, yes and that is another question we get asked often because it is another potential concerning data point point. Um, and at this point we are not seeing that trend, and I think there's a lot of anecdotal <coughs> stories about certain companies that are picking up and leaving, but um, we have a demography unit that tracks that, and the most recent data, they're, they're actually waiting for the most re recent data, which would be 2022. Um, the 2021 data is a little bit difficult to interpret because it's pandemic, um, folks moving mm -hmm. in and out because of the pandemic mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. of hybrid, or actually 100% telework, and so mm -hmm. we're waiting for the 2022 data, but at this point, point the the data is not showing that we are losing you know scores of millionaires and or businesses um, but that is something that we think about and I think that's partly how we build our budget to make sure that we are supporting small businesses um, economic development not overburdening businesses um, and it, there's that balance that I think this this governor is is aware of concerned about and and we we as an administration talk about often and so um, appreciate the question, and it is something that we are tracking, and we hope to have more current data soon. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then, in terms of our bonding, are we still uh, are we still okay in terms of our bondability as a state? And do you do you see any um, reduced rating coming down the path? Um, also, good questions. I, I, for the first question, is our um, our debt service to um, you know revenue is is um, where we want it to be below a 6% mm -hmm. ratio. And mm -hmm. um, even with the Prop 1 and potentially other mm -hmm. bonds that we hear people talking about, um, such as a climate bond, um, we have anticipated what that might look like for debt service and are not overly concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of being downgraded, I'm, I can't really speak to that. I think that there's concern because of the revenue situation and the budget shortfalls. We, um, talk about the future, um, you know, programmatically. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what I'm thinking about. But mm -hmm. I, I have, I don't really have any input into um, what might happen on on the ratings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about the? Um, do we have bonds that are coming up for renewal at higher interest rates? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that question. I'm not. Sp I'm. I'm not our bond expert, but yeah. I think that okay. it's likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Emron. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Lee, for your presentation. I know it's a very, very busy time of year, so I just want to commend you for all the work that you've done and all the work ahead as well. I wanted to ask about the stock market. We've been seeing some gains, some record gains in the stock market. 
late last year and then February, I believe the Dow Jones and S&P 500 both hit record highs. So when, when do we as a state start to realize that capital gains? Yeah, uh, that is something that our um, economists and our revenue folks in-house are tracking. And I think generally when the stock market does well, California does well because we do have that you know top 1%. Um, they make up 50% of our, our pit rev revenue that comes in, which is you know quite sizable. It goes back to your question about mm -hmm. the concern we have of those people leaving the state. Um, I think the, the question is always when um, those transactions occur and when funding, you know, that capital gains are actually realized. And I think that's the part we don't know. Um, I think folks are doing well and they're trading, um, but in terms of the capital gains, and that's what we'll, we see coming into the pit revenue, that's always a mystery of when, when they will cash out and, and see, those, see those dollars and the state then sees those revenue gains. But we, it is a hopeful sign, I'll put it that way. And um, it does usually trail, so when things happen, usually months after that we see any um, um, movement in, in our cash receipts. Understood. I'm looking forward to that. I want to mm -hmm. focus my next and very last question on, on education. You mentioned the reductions in the education infrastructure. The controller is, is a young working mother, um, and myself, I'm a former school che teacher, and we we're both very excited about the rollout of transitional kindergarten TK by 2025-2026. Yet many school districts across California lack the facilities and infrastructure to accommodate the full implementation of early childhood education. The governor's proposed budget as is seeks a reduction of 550 million towards educational facilities. So is the governor's proposal in reliance of a, the $14 billion school bond measure that is slated in the November 2024 election in order to address these facility needs? I think that was part of the calculus that it went into this. And you know, none of these reductions were easy, are easy. Um, they may get more difficult if we need to come up with even more solutions. And so I think in cases where we could draw down federal funds, we've considered that. In cases where we could backfill with other funds, we considered that. And I think specifically for some of the infrastructure programs uh, on the education side, the idea was that we might be able to look to a bond. And the same for climate, on some of the climate resource reductions, is there might be a climate bond. Of course, those are all maybes, um, but uh, it, they are possibilities where in some cases there's no, no backfill. And so I would say that that, is, that that did go into some of the calculus for that reduction. Understood. Thank you, Ms. Lee, and uh, Madam Chair, yield back. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no further questions for Ms. Lee, I, I want to thank you so much for coming here today. And it's extremely helpful for us to know about some of these realities. And in particular, we're often interfacing with our county boards as su supervisors. And the solutions that impact on the counties are of particular interest to us. And uh, my hat is off to everyone at Department of Finance. I know it's not a uh, a real fun time to come into work and, and have to deal with looking at uh, these programs and what can be done to um, address this shortfall. But I want to thank you so much for uh, keeping us up to date, and we'll be watching for the May revise and whatever is, is coming down the pike for us to know about. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. I think we can um, go on now to our, uh, go back to item two, and we have uh, a series of um, constitutional functions to uh, work through uh, with Mr. McCool uh, presenting. So thank you so much, Mr. McCool. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lieber and honorable members of the board. My name is Jack McCool, Chief of the State Assessed Properties Division. The State Assessed Properties Division performs routine audits of state assessees under the authority of the California Revenue and Taxation Code Section 828 and Government Code Section 15618. The purpose of a property tax audit is to determine the accuracy, completeness, and reliability of the financial data furnished by state assessees and used by the board in the valuation process. 
Audits also include an internal review of the methods, calculations, and assumptions used by the State Assessed Properties Division. Before you today for your consideration are two property tax audits completed by State Assessed Properties Division staff. The assessees have been presented with a copy of the audit report and provided an opportunity to provide additional information in response to the audit report. Neither of the assessees provided additional information. Upon adoption of each audit, the assessee will receive official notice of their value change and are provided 50 days in which they may appeal. The first audit for the board's consideration is for Harbor Cogeneration Company, LLC. I am available to answer any questions if needed, and I ask for your adoption of this audit. Thank you. Um, members, are there any questions or comments on item two? Mr. Schaefer. Yes. <coughs> Uh, Mr. McCool, uh, this involves 2.2 million uh, uh, in escape taxes. There are a total of uh, five audits that, that exceed $2 million in escape taxes. Uh, uh, I asked you once before, uh, uh, what is our recourse if we find that there's uh, somebody playing games with us, not acting in good faith, and you indicated that uh, we... Uh, can assess a larger fine, mm -hmm. and I indicated that as a former prosecutor, I think we should have the district attorney <laughs> take a look at this issue, uh, <laughs> compare it with uh, uh, possible uh, malafides, which is bad intention. Uh, uh, if maybe the assessor's next door neighbors or drinking buddies or gets a campaign a contribution from this person, now this is all relevant. Uh, uh, have we, and you indicated in your 28 years of working with us or so that you have not run into the, any of these problems. Uh, uh, can we assume that all of our uh, uh, patrons, uh, the people who do business with us, are honest? Uh, I don't think that's factual. Uh, tell me what, uh, what, what you can tell me to make me feel that things are, are being properly audited. Uh, I think the phrase I'm thinking of is trust but verify. Um, so we do have good working relationships with the vast majority of our state SSEs, and one of the, um, you know, the goals of our audit program is to verify that the information they're providing to us is accurate. So when we are conducting our audit program every year, um, if we ever encounter something we feel is fraudulent, you know, that's something we could assess an additional penalty for. Uh, fortunately, that has not been the case. Um, but going forward, you know, if if we do find something along those lines, uh, we would have the authority to assess the additional penalty. But you just have the authority to assess. You don't have the authority to prosecute. That's the district attorney of, of our county, of each county. Correct. If we ever came across a situation where we thought there was fraudulent activity, I would be in contact with BOE's legal department for additional advice. How do we find out about the dirt? Is uh, uh, some angry taxpayer will call or write us, or uh, uh, do we check with the Fair Political Practices Commission, or uh, uh, do we get any anonymous? Uh, I'm not big on anonymous information, but here I think it's something that we could investigate. But that hasn't happened in your tenure. No, it has not. Generally speaking, we select companies for audit. Um, the primary reasons are inconsistencies in reporting. Um, some cases we select candidates for audit who have not filed a property statement in several years. Those are generally our, our top two um, criteria. Well, I want you to know if it involves over a million dollars I, uh, and you find something that's questionable, I want you to let Mr. Schaefer know about it, we'll okay? Do. We'll do. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Any other questions uh, for Mr. McCool? Okay. Um, and I should have noted earlier that uh, contribution disclosure forms are not required on this item pursuant to government code sections uh, 15626. And um, members, the recommended motion is to adopt the audit report for Harbor Cogeneration uh, Company. Uh, Mr. Vasquez moves and uh, Mr. Gaines seconds. And uh, we do not have any written comments or anyone in the auditorium who wished to make a public comment for this item. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator, 
Moderator, if you would please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding item two on the agenda. I hope we haven't lost our AT&T moderator. AT&T moderator? Shall we keep going or give them a minute to? Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry, my line was on mute. I'm sorry, my line was on mute. <laughs> if you have any questions, please press one then zero. And there are no line, no lines in queue. Thank you. Um, members, is there any further discussion on this item? Um, if not, we have uh, a motion um, from Mr. Vasquez and a second um, from Mr. Gaines to adopt the audit report on this item. And we can have Ms. Chiquetti call the roll. Aye. Vice Chair Gaines. Aye. Member Vasquez. Aye. And Member Schaefer. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you so much. We'll go on to uh, item three, which is also presented um, by Mr. McCool. Excuse me, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I would move that item three, uh, four, five, six, seven, and eight be consolidated for purposes of his presentation and as to our action thereon. Un unfortunately, I, I wish that were a possibility for us today because we've got a number of them, um, but we do need to take them one at a time uh, for the purpose of our communications with each of the taxpaying entities. Thank you. Okay, I tried. <laughs> you did try, and that was a great thought, <laughs> one that crossed my mind a number of times. Mr. McCool, item three. Thank you. Chair Lieber and honorable members, the next audit is for KDDI America Incorporated. They were provided a copy of their audit findings and report. They will also have 50 days after adoption of the audit findings in which they may file an appeal. I am available to answer any questions, and I ask for your adoption of the audit for KDDI America Incorporated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCool. Uh, members, so any questions? Uh, we have uh, a motion to adopt the audit report for KDDI from um, Mr. Gaines and um, seconded by Mr. Vasquez. Uh, we don't have any written uh, communications or persons in the auditorium today, so we'll go to our AT&T moderator to see if there's anyone who would like to comment on item three. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, please press one then zero. And there is no one in queue. Okay, uh, members, if there's no further discussion, uh, we can go to Ms. Chiquetti to call the roll. Okay, again, uh, this matter is a constitutional function, therefore the deputy controller may not participate in this item. I will take the roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, we'll go on now to item four, the Landscaped Assessment uh, Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Mr. McCall. Thank you. Um, Chair Lieber and honorable members, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 758 allows for the addition of assessments to the roll that have escaped assessment. I'm here this morning to present land escape assessments for the board's consideration. Items number four through eight on the agenda represent new property acquired by state SSEs that they failed to report timely and as a result escaped assessment. All five SSEs have been notified of the escaped assessments, have been given an opportunity to provide additional information to change our escaped assessment findings. In addition, each assessee will have 50 days after adoption of the escaped assessments to 
file an appeal if they so choose. The first set of landscape assessments for the board's consideration are for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. I'm available to answer any questions and I ask for adoption of these escaped assessments. Thank you. Okay, members, a uh, question, uh, Mr. Vasquez. Yes, Madam Chair, <coughs> just a quick one. Uh, just in looking through the list, uh, Mr. McCoy, I noticed that all escaped assessments were filed late by the same companies every year. Is there anything we can do to minimize that? I don't know if it's an outreach issue or educational issue or what? Generally speaking, these assessees are some of our larger ones and they have the most property and their reporting requirements are very high. There's a lot of property transactions that they process every year and unfortunately not all are received by our office in a timely manner. Um, we generally speaking try to group these maybe once or twice a year rather than doing them as we receive them. Um, as long as we have these um, before the board, before uh, we do our role setting each year, they will appear on the, this year's role um, accordingly. So we do try to group these. We m could come before the board more frequently, um, but we do try to just do this as one or once or twice a year. Um, but generally speaking, you know, we have good coordination and communication with these assessees. It's just the volume that they deal with, and it's unfortunately just not everything gets timely filed. Okay, Thank Ms. you. Mr. Course. Gaines. Okay, yeah, yeah just, sorry, just to follow up on that, that's a great question. I remember Vasquez, and I, because you, you've taken us through, mm -hmm. each of us has gone through each of these cases, so just as far as the public is concerned, sure. I want them to understand that we're just not voting stuff on stuff on, a, on paper. Mm -hmm. We've been given an explanation of each of these cases. Um, and in fact, there was a case earlier um, where an assessee did not, did not fill out their paperwork mm -hmm. and paid a couple million dollars in interest and penalties. Correct. So um, I, I just want to, number one, um, recognize that fact and recognize that the BOE is on it mm -hmm. and that you're on it. Mm -hmm. And if people aren't getting, if companies aren't getting these things mm -hmm. done in a timely manner, then there's, there's costs associated with that. And um, so um, I just wanted to make, make that clarification. Thank you. And if I may add the other component in, in these particular um, filings for these land acquisition parcels uh, is the coordination with the assessor's offices. So once something becomes state assessed, there is coordination between our office and that individual assessor's office that should no longer appear on their role. So in some cases, we actually will hear from the assessors first, even before we hear from mm -hmm. the assessees, mm -hmm. letting us know of the transaction. The counties, generally speaking, you know, they have a better, um, they have a, they have better information on the individual transactions. And they know our list of state assessees, they know it shouldn't appear on their role, but they do wait for the corresponding communication from our office. Mm -hmm. So when that is somewhat delayed, they do <coughs> reach out to us from time to time and ask, you know, this transaction has occurred, but we haven't received notification from the board yet. And in those cases, we will investigate with the SSE and, and inquire why we haven't received the filing. So that, I'm not sure if that happened in any of these individual cases, but that does happen on mm -hmm. a fairly regular basis. So there is a coordination between our office and the 58 assessor's offices. Great, thanks for clarifying that, thank appreciate you. it. Okay, and thank you for that, that clarification for our viewers that um, while we may be moving briskly through these, mm -hmm. it's because we've been briefed very completely by staff. Um, members, the recommended motion is to adopt the audit report for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, Mr. Gaines uh, makes a motion and Mr. Okay. Vasquez seconds. And uh, we do not. Can we just uh, correct the uh, motion to make that that we're um, adopting the escaped assessment um, as opposed to the audit yes, report? Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Uh, ado adopting the uh, escaped assessment um, report for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And the motion was by Mr. Gaines and the second by Mr. Vasquez. And we do not have um, any written comments or anyone in the auditorium who wish to make a public comment. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Uh, moderator, if you would please let us know if there's anyone waiting to make a comment on item four. 
Ladies and gentlemen on the phones, if you wish to make a comment, please press 1 then 0. And there is no one in queue. Thank you. Um, we'll bring it back, and if there's no further discussion, we'll go to Ms. Chiquetti for the roll. All righty. Again, make the comment that this matter is a constitutional function, therefore the deputy controller may not participate under government code section 7.9. I'll take roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Okay, the motion carries, and we'll go on now to item five, Southern California Edison Company land escaped assessment. Mr. McCool. Thank you, Chair Lieber. The next escapes are for Southern California Edison Company. There's one land parcel escaping assessment for the 2023 roll year. They have been provided a copy of the escaped assessment, and they will have 50 days after adoption in which they may file an appeal. I'm available to answer any questions, and I ask for your adoption of the land escaped assessment for Southern California Edison Company. Thank you. Okay, members, any uh, questions for Mr. McCool? Um, seeing none, the uh, recommended uh, motion is to adopt the uh, land escaped assessment for Southern California Edison Company. Um, we'll take uh, Mr. Vasquez making the motion and Mr. Gaines um, seconding that. And uh, we do not have any written comments or anyone in the auditorium who would like to comment on this. So we'll go to the AT&T moderator. Um, moderator, is there anyone on the line who would like to comment on item five? If you'd like to make a comment, please press one then zero. And there are no comments in queue. Thank you so much. We'll bring it back to the board, and if there are no uh, further comments or discussions, we'll go to Ms. Chiquetti for the roll. All right. Again, this item is a constitutional function. Therefore, the deputy controller may not participate in this matter under Government Code Section 7.9. I'll take roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. <coughs> okay, thank you. Members, will, uh, the motion carries. And we'll go on now to item six. This is the BNSF Railway uh, Company Land Escaped Assessment, Mr. McCool. Thank you, Chair Lieber. Um, as mentioned, the next land escapes are for BNSF Railway Company. There are three land <coughs> parcels that escaped assessment in roll year 2022. They have been provided a copy of the land escaped assessments. They will have 50 days after adoption of the assessments in which they may file an appeal. I may be I am available to answer any questions, and I ask for your adoption of these land escaped assessments. Thank you. Okay, members, any questions on this one? Um, seeing none, uh, the recommended motion is to adopt the land escaped assessment for BNSF Railway Company. So moved. And uh, we'll take Mr. Vasquez Second. and Mr. Gaines seconding. Um, and. We do not have any written comments or anyone in the auditorium who would like to make a public comment for this agenda item. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator to see if there's anyone who'd like to make a comment on item six on the agenda. Ladies and gentlemen on the phones, if you'd like to make a comment, please press one then zero. And there are no comments in queue. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to the board and ask Ms. Chiquetti to call the roll. Okay, again, this matter is a constitutional function, therefore the deputy controller may not participate in this matter under Government Code Section 7.9. I'll begin roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Okay, members, the motion carries. And we'll go on now to item seven, the uh, Los Angeles SMASA partner, limited partnership. Yes, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Lieber. As mentioned, the next land escapes are for Los Angeles SMSA limited partnership, which does business as Verizon Wireless. There are four land escapes, escaping assessment in roll years 2020, 2021, and 2022. 
they were provided a copy of the landscape assessments. They will also have 50 days after adoption of the assessments in which they may file an appeal if they so choose. I'm available to answer any questions and I ask for your adoption of the landscape assessments for Los Angeles SMSA Limited Partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, the recommended motion is to adopt uh, the landscape assessment for Los Angeles SMSA Partnership, Limited Partnership, and uh, I'll take so a moved. motion from Mr. Second. Vasquez and a second from Mr. Gaines. And we do not have public comment that is written or anyone in the auditorium who's uh, wishing to make a public comment. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator uh, to see if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a comment on item seven. If you'd like to make a comment, please press one then zero. And there are no comments in queue at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, there is a motion from Mr. Vasquez and a second from Mr. Gaines uh, to approve this land escaped assessment. And we'll ask Ms. Chiquetti to call the roll. This matter is also a constitutional function. Therefore, the deputy controller may not participate in this matter under government code section 7.9. I'll begin the roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez Aye. and Member Schaefer. Aye. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll go on to um, number eight, which is T-Mobile West LLC doing business as T-Mobile, uh, also presented by Mr. McCall. Thank you, Chair Lieber. The final landscape assessments for the board's consideration are for T-Mobile West LLC. There were 22 land parcels escaping assessment in roll years 2021 and 2022. They were provided a copy of the land escape assessments. They will also have 50 days after adoption of the escaped assessments in which they may file an appeal. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have and I ask for your adoption of the land escape assessments for T-Mobile West LLC. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. McCool, <coughs> Mr. Schaefer. Yes, Mr. McCool, the uh, total amount of assessments here, I guess over the period of Years uh, the audit uh, is 10.2 million, which is the largest of uh, of the uh, seven or eight that we discussed this morning. Uh, uh, is there some way we can encourage a little better compliance, like maybe uh, uh, suggest they add a staff member or two uh, uh, as necessary uh, if they're really you said they had like 22 parcels or so. Uh, uh, I just can't see that everyone else seems to comply and uh, the amounts run no more than a million or so except for Southern California Edison and T-Mobile West and I just wonder if this is sort of a congenital little thing that uh, will go on forever or uh, do we see some hopes of uh, getting them off our agenda? We do our very best to communicate our filing deadlines with our assessees. We're available to help them and assist them. Um, we do on these larger filings, uh, we don't, for example, require them to fill out a form for every parcel. We allow them to fill out one form and maybe attach an Excel spreadsheet with the information that we need. Um, so we do communicate and try to make things as, as easy as possible. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, seeing none, the recommended motion is to adopt the land escape assessment for T-Mobile West LLC. Um, so moved. Take Mr. Vasquez Second. and seconded by Mr. Gaines. And we do not have um, written comments or anyone in the auditorium who's hoping to make a comment on this today. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator uh, to see if there's anyone who would like to make a public comment on item eight. If you'd like to make a comment on the phones, please press one then zero. And there is no one in queue. Okay, thank you. And we have a motion um, by Mr. Vasquez and a second by Mr. Gaines. 
uh, to approve this landscape assessment. We'll, if there's no further discussion, we'll go to Ms. Chiquetti for the roll. All righty. This mass matter is also a constitutional function. Therefore, the deputy controller may not participate in this matter under government code section 7.9. I'll begin roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Okay, the motion carries. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, members. And we're going to uh, go on to our consent uh, agenda. And thank you, Mr. McCool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we'll go on to item nine, uh, which is our board meeting minutes of uh, February 21st through 22nd, uh, 2004. Uh, any comments uh, on these minutes? And if not, um, we uh, can take a motion to approve. I so move. Uh, Mr. Schaefer and uh, Mr. Gaines, did you wish to second sure, that? I'll second. Thank you. Okay, great. And we do not have anyone in the uh, audience, nor has anyone submitted uh, written comments about our minutes from February. Uh, so we'll go to the AT&T moderator to see if anyone would like to make a comment about item nine. Ladies and gentlemen, on the phones, if you'd like to make a comment, please press one, then zero. And there is no one in queue. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Mr. Schaefer has made the motion. Mr. Gaines seconded. And we'll ask Ms. Chiquetti to please call the roll. All righty. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Deputy Controller Emron? Aye. Okay. Um, members, we are going to take our 10 minute break. Um, now and it's uh, 11.07 so we'll come back at 11.17. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, members will come back together now at uh, 1121. And our next item is item 11, the board member strategic plan. <coughs> and we have um, two members who would like to present a discussion on this. Uh, the first will be Mr. Emron for the state controller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning again to everyone. Um, uh, the members we uh, the controller got to circulate a strategic plan memorandum last week hope everyone got a chance to read it I know it's a strategic plan that many of the members have been working on the past several years so in my presentation I'm going to try to be as concise as possible here but I just want to thank uh, the board members our executive director the entire agency this was a process that the controller partnered with member Vasquez back all the way in 2019 to establish strategic priorities for the board of equalization with the board formally adopting the strategic plan in June of 2020. Uh, the strategic plan is a foundational document to the board's commitment of good governance, enhancing taxpayer experiences and services, enhancing the employee experience, education, and ult ultimately telling the BOE story, a story that dates back well over 100 plus years. I wanna thank everyone for their commitment to the strategic plan and an oppor opportunity to present to you an update of where we are, including the items completed and those that are in progress specifically want to focus on controller Cohen's two goals, uh, goals one and two. And for the record, I want to read in goal one to ensure the board's constitutional mandates are being performed in the most cost effective, efficient and timely manner with the 58 elected assessors and California taxpayers in the forefront where 1A establishes that the agency has the resources and infrastructure necessary to fulfill its workload and goal two to establish and meet workload priorities and provide direction for members to achieve statewide objectives and workload in a manner that ensures maximum transparency and opportunity for open discussions. Starting with goal 1A, um, resources and infrastructure focus. The controller believes that there's been substantial progress that's been made in this area. And to take it to uh, what we call a touchdown is for the executive director to facilitate a formal assessment of the organization to confirm that the agency has the full authorities, resources, and infrastructure necessary to carry out the constitutional responsibilities in administering California's $85 billion property tax system. And once this overall assessment is completed, the executive director will come back to this board and provide a full presentation on the assessment results and a plan of action to address any resource gaps that remain. Um, if the board's at will, this would be an action taken up and completed in the summer of 2024. And based on those results, moving it to the governor's office and the legislature and other parties or stakeholders to address the needs of the board and make sure that the resources and infrastructure necessary workload have been met. Moving on to goal 1B, um, the board member's fiscal responsibility, ethical accountability, and commitment to public service. This is a, a goal that I'm happy to report out has been successful. The executive director and the controller have partnered in this effort. Moving on to goal 1C to establish board members have the resources and infrastructure necessary to fulfill their constitutional responsibilities. Of 1C1, the controller member Vasquez and the executive director will put this work on hold until 1A is completed with the anticipation uh, at the end of this year. And then lastly, goal two of determining the board's strategic priorities the board so far has convened three statewide hearings and thanks to member Vasquez and his leadership and additional informational hearing this past year in Santa Monica. Controller Cohen is committed to exploring the convening of two additional statewide informational hearings focused on emerging issues facing property tax administration. Once those hearings are completed, Controller Cohen will work with the chair, the vice chair, the executive director to complete the rest of the goals 2A2 through 2A4. So, Thank you, board members. Our discussions, our collaboration, our commitment to the strategic plan will enable us to continue the development of meaningful and substantive framework to guide this board for the next generation and beyond. <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Member Vasquez. I, I yield to you. A uh, question. Um, uh, do you know when the, uh, the two additional hearings <laughs> might be scheduled? Uh, it's the goal of the controller to have at least one this year. Um, depends on the emerging issues. One issue that we've been working on is technological issues, uh, but that will be something uh, at least will happen in, in this term right here that we're in. 
So up until 2026. If we could coordinate it with a regular meeting, if it's going to be here uh, or if it's going to be elsewhere, uh, I just want you to know that Tony and I have uh, concern to be able to participate. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Vasquez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Emron, for that great presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and the accomplishments moving forward, uh, I'll try not to repeat what you've said and kind of try to fill in the gaps and let's see if we can open up for discussion afterwards. Like in gold, I guess it's 1B, the core reports for training that assure the members fiscal responsibility, ethical accountability, and commitment to public service. I'm also pleased to hear that under gold 1A, the executive director will conduct a formal infrastructure uh, assessment of the organization to confirm whether the agency has the full authority and resources needed to carry out their workload and that she recommend an action plan to the board in July. This is an important and probably time consuming effort but it's a paramount for the employees and everyone who does business with the board and I applaud your plan on gold 1C one to collaborate with the executive director to secure one additional exempt position supported by facility savings to ensure that each member has a confidential executive assistant possibly needed to help us fulfill our constitutional response recent workload. And on our plan under goal 2A to work with the executive director and the chair to possibly convene two or more hearings, which you've kind of touched on now, uh, the last one I had, and, and I guess, and when the executive director undertakes the infrastructure assessment under Gold 1A, will it point out the quantity where the agency has the gaps, delays, or shortfalls because of the lack of resources? While it is a tremendous credit to the staff for all that they do uh, and the revenue generated with so few resources, I think enhancing their assets and resources is critical. Regarding goal 2A on the possibility of convening two more informational hearings this year, uh, would you, I guess, would you be open uh, to the ideas of emerging issues as they come forward, uh, preferably to prepare the announcements with some specific plans, you know, down the road? Yes, That's exactly, the only thing Mr. I would Vasquez. Recommend. And with that, I'll turn it back to Chair, Vice Chair, and see if there's any other comments or suggestions from any of the other board members? Uh, comments or questions or suggestions? I, uh, a, concern, I, a concern I have, and uh, I want to move forward with this because I think we do have to make sure that we're keeping our strategic plan updated, and we want to know what that vision is for the future. Um, but I've got a concern on, you know, as to whether it's going to cost us money. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I'm saying that, we just had this review, and I want to thank the controller for organizing that, but I'm concerned about our budget. And so I'm wondering if we could at, at least explore this idea of moving forward in an economical fashion. Is there, is there an opportunity for us to take a look at this strategic plan and do it amongst ourselves? I think we've got a pretty good idea of how the BOE operates. Uh, we've got a team here, and um, so I'm just throwing that out there as an option. I'd want to obviously hear from the controller on this before we did proceed, um, but definitely we need to to follow through on a strategic plan. We need to update it. Um, I just want to make sure we can do it within the confines of a tight budget. <coughs> so, I think we were kind of banking on the savings because I know, you know, not everybody has uh, has been fully staffed. And I'm hoping that, and maybe the executive director could clarify this, that we could tap into that, right? Because you're right. You know, we don't want to, especially with, you know, what we're hearing in terms of the deficit, seems to be growing every day. Yeah. I, I don't want to make that another burden on 
Yes, and maybe if I can add to what's been said before, we have the executive director um, s step in. Um, I'm I'm really concerned about the environment in which we find ourselves, and, and the fact that you now we heard from the um, the finance uh, department about cuts in uh, climate, education, affordable housing. Uh, CalWORKs, um, some pretty large shifts within the budget, and, and I think we'd um, put ourselves in a difficult position if we're uh, asking for outside contractors or even uh, an additional exempt position right now at this point in time. Um, I, I think uh, we might be in a, a, a very difficult place with that. And, and maybe our executive director could elucidate that. Um, would like to answer some of your questions. Um, but, and a lot of times I, I answer backwards, so I'm gonna try to go forward this time. And let's start with the beginning. Um, I want to first say um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item, the board member's strategic plan. Since I've been asked to provide input, I would like to say that I believe that Controllers Cohen's proposal to conduct a formal external assessment is a constructive ex exercise that could help determine BOE's future and is worthy of consideration. But let me first begin with the review of what we've done so far. At the December 22 meeting and the July 23 meeting, I reported that the board to this board that I completed my internal assessment of the agency and that I had a plan of action to implement to ensure that the agency had the necessary resources and infrastructure to fulfill our constitutional and statutory duties. For the past five and a half years, the executive management team has also reported on the many achievements realized in our rebuilding and revitalization efforts. However, I note that my reports have all been verbal and it could be beneficial if I put this report in writing and that report would be very helpful in deciding the scope of any future formal assessment. With this board's permission, um, I would say that I can, if you want the report, I can get this report completed within the first, the last quarter, or minute, spring or summer. Um, it's gonna take some time um, because we do have other reviews that are coming up and the person who's gonna be tasked with writing the report is also <laughs> going to have to deal with a review that we have. But I also would like to take the time and map out and costs of an external formal assessment. I know that Controller Cohen is thinking July 2024 would be the date that it would be completed, but if we're talking about hiring a third party vendor to do the assessment, we are going to have to <coughs> go to bid and we're going to have to go through the state contract process. And we know that doesn't happen overnight. And then once we get to a vendor, we are going to have to spend time with that vendor explaining what we do and how we do it. So then that vendor can say, based on what you are currently doing, here's what, and based on what you've already identified as gaps, here's what we think you can do additionally. So it's, 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 not, it's not a six month project, guaranteed it. But I think, again, that it's, it is worthwhile to see how we could continue to revitalize and modernize the BOE. Um, I do want to emphasize that under this board leadership, we have definitely rebuilt and revitalized, and we have, in my opinion, exceeded expectations. And I'm confident once you have that written report, you will see as well of all of our, the great work that we're doing. 
um, in respect to the actual strategic plan, I you know there is an agency strategic plan and there is a board member strategic plan. The agency strategic plan is for 2020-2025, um, and the main goals rebuild, revitalize, and modernize. Those goals are very similar to the board member strategic plan goal 1A. It's the same, we have the same focus, we're on the same page. But I note that for the, our strategic plan, we we're coming to a time where we do need to update. We're halfway there, I say we rebuilt, um, but we're always assessing the agency. So we're, it's time for us to um, start thinking about our strategic plan update for 25, 28. I also note that the board member strategic plan initially was, we had the meeting in 2019. Um, the plans covered 2020 through 2023. Most of the goals in that plan have been completed. Um, there's still a question of goal one and goal two. And again, me doing, giving you a report on the formal assessment, you can make a decision on if you need to continue with goal one or do you want to go with a different direction? If this board would like to um, update their strategic goals for the future, I am available to assist. Um, when you did it in 2019, we did it in open <coughs> meeting. We, you guys hired a consultant to facilitate that exercise. We all sat right around here in a circle. I am confident that we could do it again. Ms. Bonatti um, is available. She's been volunteered to facilitate, and we don't have to hire <laughs> someone. We could do it ourselves. Um, she could be the note taker. We would transcribe everything for you. Um, the chair, the vice chair, the chair is uh, organization management is is your is your thing. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> if that's desire of the board. And then I, there's some of the things on the, on the goals that I, I think we need to correct the record on. Uh, I think it's goal two, when you talk about um, using facility savings in order to have an exempt staff person. Lisa, please explain. <laughs> Good morning, Lisa Renati, Chief Deputy Director. Uh, Generally, it's in gen establishment of a position has to come through the uh, budget change proposal process. So we would have to go, and if you wanted to create another position, we would have to provide data to Department of Finance, who would then put it into their budget, and then could go forward to the legislature to get approval for an additional position. Um, I, it makes sense to me why you would think using facility savings would be a means for you to create more positions. However, when it comes to facility savings, it's one of our OE&E operating expenses. Um, it's, you can only use those funds within that category of operating expenses. And when it comes to facility savings, it's a little different mm -hmm. because each it's board member doesn't have yeah. their own, your facilities, don't, you don't have your own facilities budgets. It rolls up to the agency's budget. And as we reduce our facilities um, costs, Although I, we like to shout it from the rooftops how well we're doing at making sure we're using, you know, reducing our costs. Mm -hmm. It just goes back to the general fund. It doesn't, we don't get more money to spend on travel or infrastructure. So uh, unfortunately that's not, a, uh, it's not available for us to use that facility savings to create more positions. Um, but I also like to say um, when Ms. Dower has talked about all the work we've done in the last four years, we've done it without additional positions. We've redeployed positions we have in the agency We've used them differently. We haven't create, had received any new positions. So all the work we've done so far has been with current existing resources. Prop 19 has been a big one. Yeah, exactly. Prop 19, yes, we, d we so. did manage to, um, <laughs> to do that. And at the time, we had a high vacancy rate. And um, we were asking, <coughs> going forth, asking for more positions. And they, you know, we were told to fill our vacancies. So we have, so. I mean, we've asked twice, you know, when Prop 19 came in, we definitely asked, and it was a hard no. We recently, and, we, and we're gonna go again, 
and ask for more positions within our um, property tax department. We're not giving up. They told us no. I did not like the no, but the no was mainly due to the budget deficit. So we are going to go again, and we're seeing, we see the need, and you know, I can't continue to have um, the team work to midnight seven days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there, you know, Mr. Young and his team, Mr. Mr. Jack McCool and his team, they're, they're, they're soldiers, they, they do an excellent job, and mm -hmm. they, they take on all the assignments that you give me, it actually goes to them. <laughs> so, um, I, don't know, I guess what I'm saying is that, with your permission, let me give you a report and really map it out so you can see what we have accomplished, where I see the, the need continues to be, and then make a decision if you want to have another assessment of the agency, knowing that assessing the agency is an ongoing activity for us. We just don't assess say, okay, that's done and move on. We're, const we're constantly looking at what can we do to improve, make it better, make it bigger. Mm -hmm. Just build an empire. You know, you, you guys talk about um, some programs that you would like to have, whether it's a new program, newly enacted legislation that we could have BOE be responsible for, or if it's a, a an old program. But I think that the first step is to have this formal report mm -hmm. that you guys can really see what's been done. Okay. But then, but excuse um, me, just a follow up that on the categorical yeah. funding. I know you mentioned obviously you can't move facility dollars <coughs> into staffing, but do we have savings within staffing? Because I know not all of us have been <coughs> able to fulfill or fill our vacancies within our respective offices. What happens to that, or is that even a, an option? Well, most of, and I don't <laughs> like to talk about individual board members' I didn't operation, wanna, but let me say yeah. this. In general. In general speaking, although uh, there may be a vacancy or two, most board members' offices are using retired annuitants. Right. And we are paying for those retired annuitants through the vacant position. Okay. So, no. There's no real savings. <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Good question. Did, Other did I, questions? Did I get that right? <laughs> yes, you got it. You got it right. And um, the vacancies within board member vacancies are different than agency vacancies. Um, so we can't just borrow from each other. Um, and uh, but you can. There's reclassification of positions. Uh, there is available. If you have, say, you have an information officer and you want it to be a different, maybe uh, an, an AGPA. There is a process to change those, um, but it's subject to budgetary constraints uh, and approval from CalHR and DOF. Um, the, as far as to go to an exempt position, I, I, <coughs> we haven't done that. It's something we worked on in 2018, attempting to get that done, and that would be a different process. But as far as getting new positions using vacancies, okay. and I would say as yeah. far as exempt, I, do, I believe in the memo, the, the original goal was confidential exam right. that's going to be a high hurdle um, there's a there's an act there's a law that basically defines what is confidential and it's not just because you work for a, a constitutional officer or you work for the executive director and you may receive confidential files it's a higher bar and CalHR is going through a review of all agencies to have confidential exempt positions and if their review is disclosing that they don't meet that requirement, they are removing that classification. Okay. And Mr. Emron and then Mr. Gans. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate you, Executive Director Stowers. You've been doing some amazing work. And you mentioned the empire. It's a rebuild effort. You know, Rome wasn't built in seven days, neither was the BOE. So as we rebuild the Board of Equalization, we're taking the necessary and mission critical steps towards restoring our national reputation. That includes building the administration out, leading in statewide training, being key players when it comes to taxpayer outreach, branding on a national level. And the strategic plan has been five years in the making, we, but we also understand that COVID took us off our course, and that's understandable, but it's time to get back to serving California's taxpayers in the fourth largest economy in the world. 
something that Mr. Vasquez always uh, speaks out to me and says, it's, it's time for the BOE to go on the offensive. And I think every year we hold our breath thinking what the legislator, not if, but when and how they're gonna try to take elected powers and duties away from this board. So this strategic plan is going on the offensive and showing that we are restoring ourselves and building back to that national um, reputation that we always, always have been striving for. And my very, very last point, um, you, we are a constitutional office, so Ms. Renati mentioned too a little bit in her presentations every month that we're not under any mandate, it's just the state ex expects us to be smart and wise with our spending. And then lastly, the controller's point in regards to cost saving, she believes that this will ultimately reduce costs because it'll show the board we are efficient, where we are efficient and where we can cut costs. Um, so I'm hoping that we can find some type of middle ground too. Um, if the board's open to some type of cost analysis and scope and maybe receiving board input from the executive director, her going out and seeing if it's feasible, if it's something uh, that vendors are even willing to take on and kind of seeing how we can go about that process. But uh, I want to leave it up to the board um, on that. But I think when we talk about building back the board of equalization to where it was, the strategic plan is, is, is core to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gaines. Yeah, um, I want to uh, thank the uh, Deputy Controller and your comments. Um, and uh, I mean, I agree uh, in terms of uh, going on the, the offense and uh, determining what our vision is for the BOE is critical. And, um, and I, I want to be part of that and part of that planning. And we definitely need to proceed. Um, and I'm, I'm open to looking um, at options. I, I would like the executive director to explore that. And I'd like to make sure that we're in communication with Controller Cohen uh, as we uh, move forward. Um, because I, I, I we, def we definitely need to, we, we have been under attack. I mean, it's clear. We're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit later in the agenda. but. Um, you know, we, we've got to, I think we've gotten to the point where the agency is not only stabilized, uh, but it's, it's thriving, but where do we go from here? What, what are the next steps? And we've got um, a lot of talent here, and I, th I think it can be utilized in a few other areas if we sit down and talk about what our strategic plan is. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schaefer. Yes, uh, Deputy Controller mentioned uh, Rome not being built. Uh, when you mentioned Rome, uh, Emperor Nero was uh, playing his violin while Rome was burning. <laughs> and uh, we're not Rome, we're the state of California, and we're not burning, but we've got a, uh, a deficit in the billions of dollars that would uh, frighten any government. Uh, that's why I'd like us to be careful when we're hiring additional people. Uh, I can assure you that there's at least a million dollars in payroll that this board up here is not paying right now because we all, each of us, have a couple of staff vacancies and uh, we would fill them if we really had something urgent for them to do. But I think what we're doing is our present staff is working double time to be sure we get it done as an efficiency because actually the people who work for are the taxpayers and we have to respect them. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm glad to see uh, uh, what's going on here, but I'd like to see that any workshop and goal that we have is something we can fill within 12 to 24 months. Uh, all the dates on page one of this report today are, are uh, four years old, five years old, 1919, 1920. Uh, you know, in four or five years is a lifetime here on the board because we have elections come and go. We change chief councils. We change... Uh, uh, executive directors, uh, uh, we have just a lot of changes going on, and uh, uh, those of us that are continuing while we're here like to see efficiency and economy, and we also like to see something done within two years instead of four years, so, um, you know, we can live to see it to fruition. Uh, my contract with the board runs till uh, um, two more years, and I'm I'm going to be here to see that uh, whatever we want to do, we get done. So I want to commend you with what you're doing, but I want you to know that uh, uh, I don't want anybody playing the violin, okay? 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And um, I'll offer up some comments here <laughs> since they're burning a hole through me. Um, I, I would like to see the information that the executive director has already put together that we've already, in essence, paid for. Um, have her present that in maybe the August, September, October time frame. And then we'll have a much better budget understanding by that time. Uh, I, I've never seen a, a consultancy report like this that costs anything less than $500,000, and it's usually a million dollars. That's just what the consultants want to start their engines. And um, so I'd like to see the report from the executive director in, in a time frame that's reasonable um, before we go anywhere towards it. And, you know, every, every time I hear someone say, well, it, it, if we don't use it, it just slips away. It just goes back to the general fund. Okay, the general fund is where we have problems right now with affordable housing, with CalWorks, who are, uh, are for people in a desperate situation, um, for our other human service needs. So to me, if the funding doesn't get used and it goes back to the general fund, this is what this is the expectation that the taxpayers have of us. And, and by and large, right now, people in California are working really hard for the money. Um, and um, so that's on the, on the report. I'd like to have a stepwise process where we look at that. And, and um, then in terms of hearings in other parts of the state, I'm, I'm okay with that. If we can uh, economize greatly, I think we were able to economize greatly with the um, Los Angeles hearing. And um, so I think those can be, can be very fruitful hearings. In terms of um, uh, the thought that we need to grow the influence of uh, the agency or expand outward in terms of our footprint, that really sets off alarms for me because what I would like to do is always keep in mind <coughs> the things that a normal state agency does. So the DMV is not trying to increase its footprint and its recognition nationwide. Uh, uh, you know, CDCR any other state agency. It's just fulfill our mission as, as effectively and as frugally as we possibly can. So that's what I'm, I'm always looking for. Um, so I, I can't support um, securing this, but uh, uh, additional uh, exempt positions, uh, especially uh, um, you know, of, of the exempt nature. I think that we all have open positions that are, are non-exempt, you know, classified, whatever we want to call them, um, positions. And, um, and those workers have additional workplace protections. Um, they are um, just less likely to be focused on what is it that I can do to satisfy the member and what can I do to meet the needs of, of the public. And I think that that's the, the direction that we need to go in. I also think that 2019 to 2023, this plan is now exhausted in a certain sense. And even though all of the objectives in it haven't been fulfilled, I think it's time to, at some point when our work plan allows it, to come back and take a fresh look at, uh, at those objectives um, because things have really changed a lot since 2019. Um, Earlier, when we heard from Ms. Lee from the Department of Finance, she was talking about we're in a completely different world 
in terms of r remote working um, un until, you know, late spring of 2020, that was not predominant in, in many of the workplaces in California, and now it is. So things have really changed a lot. And I think that we need to um, take another cut at it. Uh, but what I'm looking for um, is, is not in this year uh, additional expenditure, but kind of hunker down, um, see how we can get through it with an eye towards the um, situation of the legislature and then ultimately uh, the situation of our constituents and taxpayers. I think that as we talked about earlier very briefly, one of our um, most connected relationships is with our county assessors and our county board of supervisors. And in their world, these cuts are are really impactful because the families that have a family member with disabilities, the people that need affordable housing within communities are, are right in their faces. And um, in my own county, we're probably one of the wealthiest counties in California in terms of the personal income tax and, and resources that the county has. And um, I, I look at all the time how long are the waiting lists for emergency shelter? Well, right now, county workers are calling people who got on the emergency list in November. So, so for me, it's um, constantly, uh, how do we right-size ourselves to deal with the jurisdiction that we have uh, at this point, and, and really, um, protect resources, um, respect for money <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is a huge deal with me. Um, many of my constituents are heavily rent burdened. Uh, they're working five jobs between two parents. And, um, and so they don't relate to kind of the... <coughs> Uh, the world when we're talking about, you know, in the billions of dollars, um, they they are tied to the world of there's no way that I can pay the rent and um, and not be living at work and sleepwalking through decades of their lives. So that's just kind of where I'm at um, on this is uh, I want to see what we can do with the information that we have. Um, get that going. I, I think that the board should also spend a session looking at the agency's uh, strategic directions and what is the health of the agency from our professional staff's perspective and then have that influence what we do on our strategic planning uh, going forward. But I, I do think we need to take a refresh of um, what we have here and also take a breather as we see what comes out of the May revise and you know what kind of numbers are coming out um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the summer in terms of where the legislature's head is at. And um, you know, Ted and I had the experience of being in the legislature at a time when we had to cut one third of the state budget and it was pretty pretty horrific. It kept me up um, many, many nights. And um, uh, so I think we have to kind of be grounded in knowing where that fiscal cliff is and, and keeping as many people as far away from it as we can. Um, because in our tenure in the legislature, we saw people fall over that cliff and we were cutting things like adult diapers for people with really profound disabilities. And uh, so we just have to be very, very, very careful with money. And paying, paying on IOUs. Paying, paying on. like vendors. Mm -hmm. No, we're not gonna give you a check. Yeah, you Ted is. IOU. Mr. Gaines is <laughs> completely right here. 
we're issuing IOUs to small businesses. And employees, too. And employees for seven months. And um, small first-generation businesses who are service providers and, and others. And, and uh, they had to pay their vendors. Um, so our actions were kind of eating them alive. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and, and uh, uh, bring it back for further comments. But I think everybody kind of knows where I'm at. Mr. Vasquez. No, I appreciate I appreciate the feedback because, uh, uh, like uh, Mr. Enron mentioned, you know, uh, Controller Cohen and myself when we started this back in 2019, a lot has changed, and I'm wondering. And I and I heard from your comments, it sounds like we might be able to do uh, like a follow up retreat in house without spending money. I didn't know we had some talent here yes. within the staff <laughs> that could possibly be the facilitator because that's usually your biggest expenditure. Thank you. And we might want to think about that. I'm wondering if that makes sense, you know, given, I mean, take a look at our schedule and our workload and maybe look at one of our meetings down the road, whether it's in the summer or the fall, where, you know, we usually come up here anyways. We usually schedule or calendar a two-day board meeting. Maybe that second day is the retreat or the phase two of the retreat because we did lay out quite a bit of objectives. And a lot of those things were in a different world because it was before COVID. And now that you know, like uh, the chair had mentioned, you know, a lot of people are working remotely, so it's a whole different dynamics in terms of production and what we can expect and hopefully accomplish. And pretty much because we try to put goals in that category of long term, short term, and immediate, and we maybe need to look at those and see what, what's doable. I think what was mentioned earlier is, you know, for the most part, we have like two and a half years for most of us is to see what's what can we really bite off. And I like the fact that I'm hearing folks are now in the position to take the offense because when we first got up here, we were on the defense. And now I think we need, we're in a position where I'm hoping in that retreat we would have that discussion and what does a strategic, a strategic plan look like taking the offense as opposed to the defense? Mm -hmm. okay. I can definitely look at the calendar um, for a retreat for the second day of a board meeting. Appreciate it. Um, in the summertime. Mr. At, Gaines. At the value setting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thank Mr. You. Gaines. Yeah, I appreciate um, Chair Lieber's comments and also uh, Member Vasquez and uh, Member Emron too. Um, and I, I do like the idea if you could please give us that report that updates the progress to date. I think that would be very helpful just to have that in writing. Okay. And okay. then we and then step two would be uh, working on the strategic plan from a board perspective, but also internally and how important that is. You highlighted that, uh, Chair Lieber. And I think that is, is it. we need to know what are we hearing um, on the ground within the organization. And, um, and then I think we have, um, we have our own priorities too that we ought to kind of bet out and figure out, you know, where do we go from here? what is the proactive position for the BOE looking into the future? So, I, yeah, I, I would say let's, let, let's look at, let's get a, uh, up, a written update. Where are we? Uh, then we go ahead and set the, um, a two-day meeting where we can dedicate a, a, a full day to kind of figuring, figuring out what is our future strategic plan for the BOE. And if we need to do it more than once, we can do it more than once. I, I think yeah. I understand. I just want to just double check with Mr. <coughs> Iran. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director, Member Gaines, for your comments too, Vice Chair Gaines, uh, Member Vasquez <coughs> too. This is a, a living document. It's also a legacy document. And, and I, I think the control ultimately wants the strategic plan to continuously grow in its, in its efforts. And, and also, too, for the board to speak with one voice. And I'm hoping that there's consensus here where we can uh, have that retreat and also to uh, see where we're at and then where we need to go. Um, so I think uh, if there's a board consensus here, I think the controller will be uh, happy with this at the moment. Thank you. Okay. With report, map out the process, and board member strategic goal setting. So I'm taking that as three items yes 
And, and I think as part of the goal setting, uh, a good grounding of the members in the agency's professional staff goals f for the agency. Um, well, great. Thank you so much, um, members, for the, the input on this. And um, I think this has been a good, <laughs> a good session of, of where we're all at. And um, so uh, we're going to take public comment on this item. And um, we do not have written comments, is my understanding. And we don't have anyone in the auditorium who wants to pop up out of the foxhole <laughs> <laughs> this one. And so we're going to go to our at and moderator um, on item 11. Uh, moderator, is there anyone on the phone line who would like to um, make a comment? Ladies and gentlemen on the phones, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please press 1, then 0. And there is no one in queue. Okay, fantastic. We'll um, bring it back uh, to the board. And um, I think we've had some really great discussion on this. And let me confer with staff. Is this a, a good time for us to take our lunch hour? Or should we first um, uh, deal with uh, item 12 and then come back for the executive director reports? Yeah, Madam Chair, like do we need an hour or can we do less for lunch? Well, we have um, staff under our, our labor yes. agreements and all. It's, an, it's sure. pretty much an hour. Okay. And I think it's a good break for us. Um, given that we had the 10-minute the break um, not very long ago, should we um, take item 12? I think what we'd like to do is power through as much as we can. We do have the board work group that's tentatively scheduled at 1.30. So let's see if we could um, work up to 12.30 uh, or somewhere around there to accommodate the board work group as well. Okay, fantastic. And um, so in the spirit of powering through, <laughs> we'll um, go on now to item 12. Uh, this is uh, Franchise Tax Board um, membership uh, relative to AB 2238. And this was an item that was requested by Mr. Vasquez uh, for discussion. So we'll go to uh, Mr. Vasquez. It was actually for discussion um, and or action. So we'll go to Mr. Vasquez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and in the spirit, as we were talking earlier about going from the defense to the offense. I'm hoping uh, there's some uh, consensus here after the discussion about some action that we could take possibly here. Uh, members, I, I requested to include this piece of legislation as part of our agenda so that we can have the opportunity to discuss its efforts on our organization as well as I potentially take a board vote or a voice and opinion on this. Before the discussion, I would just like to emphasize that the BOE's importance relationship with the Franchise Tax Board. As you know, the BOE is the state-only constitutional tax agency and oversees assessment practices of 58 counties, decides appeals of state-assessed public utilities and railroad properties, and administers all property tax exemptions with the county assessors. The BOE also administers the legal entity ownership uh, program, which <laughs> gathers and disseminates to county assessors information regarding changes in control and changes in ownership that own or lease an interest in California real property. Such changes in ownership or control require reassessment of real property interest and the primary source of this information is obtained from the state income tax returns filed with the Franchise Tax Board. In administering the welfare exemption for affordable housing, the BOE also works in partnership with the Franchise Tax Board to obtain information about whether a taxpayer with a potentially eligible property receives low-income housing tax credits. The tax credits are reported on state returns filed with the Franchise Tax Board. Next, the BOE and the Franchise Tax Board partner to ensure that organizations with invalid or revoked 
exemptions are not claiming any disallowed tax benefits. Furthermore, the BOE determines if an owner organization qualifies for the exemption based on a valid, unrevoked letter or ruling from the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board stating that the organization or the local chapter is an exempt organization. As you can see, the BOE and the Franchise Tax Board serves a vital tax administration function, many of which require the cooperation and partnership of both organizations. The BOE chairperson has served on the Franchise Tax Board since its creation in 1950. I think that it's important for the BOE to continue having a seat on the Franchise Tax Board to effectively serve the California taxpayer. So with that, I'd like to just open it up uh, to the members and see what the opinions or the thoughts are as we look at this uh, bill that's, uh, I guess it's Mr. Lowe that has out there AB 2238 that would, mm -hmm. that would if approved, would remove uh, the chair of the BOE from the Franchise Tax Board. Okay, other questions or comments? Mr. Gaines. I'll weigh in. I just appreciate uh, Tony making the <coughs> clarification in terms of what the role of the chair of the BOE is in terms of sitting on the Franchi Franchise Tax Board. And I, I'm not sure how um, educated our, our, our public is, our constituent is, on that key role. And that it is, uh, it's vital. Uh, I mean, you take a look at just the welfare exemptions that we deal with on a weekly basis at the BOE, that's a, a huge uh, part of what we do. And to make sure that we're having that communication occurring uh, between the Franchise Tax Board and the BOE is critical. So we need that, um, that relationship and that role. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Member Vasquez as well for bringing this up as, as the voice uh, of the controller here on this body and her serving as chair of the Franchise Tax Board. She's, she's really honored to have uh, the BOE chair serve alongside her, alongside the Department of Finance too. And you kind of see Department of Finance coming here today, kind of the special relationship that we all hold uh, when we are together. And she fully uh, and 100% <coughs> supports the Board of Equalization. She loves the Board of Equalization and she wants to see the Board of Equalization remain as a member of of California Franchise Tax Board. We're so lucky, too. We're about to kick off our first meeting uh, mm -hmm. next next week, and um, Chair Lieber will be joining us, too, and I think it's important in an elected space uh, to have elected representation from the Board of Equalization, the only elected tax board in the country, be um, a voting member, and I think that's so, so important. So um, she fully supports uh, the Board of Equalization in this moment. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Mr. Schaefer? Uh, well, we're really not... Uh, <coughs> Uh, obligated to vote or uh, opine on this. It's a legislative matter strictly. I would rather we uh, abstain, but it's interesting to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, this is on our agenda for discussion and possible action. Um, so if a um, member desired to make a motion, uh, now would be the time to do so. Well, in hearing the feedback, it sounds like I think um, it sounds like there's a consensus that the franchise tax <coughs> board should consist of the controller, the governor's appointee, and whoever the chair of the BOE moving forward. So uh, I would uh, like to move that uh, the board officially take a position against this bill, which would eliminate. Uh, the chair of the BOE from sitting on the Franchise Tax Board. Okay. Um, motion by second. Mr. Vasquez. Is there a second? Yes. To the motion, seconded by Mr. Gaines. And the motion is to um, have the board adopt a position in opposition uh, to AB 2238. And we have no one. Um, who submitted written comments or in the auditorium <coughs> submitting comments. And I see that we have Mr. Norm Scott mm -hmm. uh, approaching the microphone. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Chair Lieber. Uh, good to see you all today, members. Um, 
in some of our discussions about this bill, something that has come up is uh, what the board's position might be if the bill were to be amended. So I just put that out for discussion, uh, whether you'd like to include anything in your motion or not about that, just so you can uh, have a plan moving forward. Okay, thank you. And I'm inferring from your comments that um, it would uh, potentially be possible to take a position of oppose unless amended if the legislation were um, were amended to add the state treasurer but retain uh, the chair of the Board of Equalization. Is that, yes, that is would that be right? an appropriate motion. I apologize for leaving the dais early. I didn't know you were going to ask anything. No, no. Thank you. Um, is, is there interest in, um, in that type of a motion uh, opposed unless amended, or are we strictly keeping it on opposed at, at this time? My position would be to move forward, take a position against the current bill, because that's the way it's written. If there was an amendment, then I, I'd be open to it, as long as whatever the amendment is includes the chair of the BOE. And let me ask a question of our deputy controller. Has the controller considered that, that type of an option? I know that the the treasurer's jurisdiction is very different from the, the tax agencies. Um, and so can you speak to that? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The controller sees uh, the, the reasoning why behind this, why the treasurer would want to be on the franchise tax board, especially what happened last year with the tax uh, deadlines being pushed back several, um, several times during these storms. It would be something she would be comfortable with at the time, but she would like to defer to the board to see where they're at, if it's going to be a hard no or a soft no if amended. Um, and, I'll, and I'll kind of leave that up to discussion. Um, Mr. Schaefer? Uh, the controller or the treasurer, whoever is the ex official member, need not appear personally, but can have their uh, deputy appear for them on the, uh, uh, the other board. So. Uh, you know, I don't think it's really that important, and I do think that uh, uh, our chair has enough to do. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just looking to make your uh, make more of your time available for our prime mission, which is to protect the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I, I oppose uh, the change. Thank you. Uh, any further thoughts on on that concept, uh, Mr. Gaines? Yeah, I'll, I'll just weigh in. I um, I wouldn't be opposed to to taking the position um, in opposition of AB twenty two thirty eight uh, unless amended. But I want to clarify what an amendment would mean. Uh, that would have to include. Uh, the BOE continuing to serve exactly. on the Franchise Tax Board. So if we mm -hmm. could have that clarity, uh, that would be fine. That would definitely be something that we would want to include in our, our letter to make that really mm -hmm. clear that mm -hmm. that's what we're, what we're considering. Um, to go to the, the maker and then the seconder, would you like to uh, amend your motion to say oppose unless amended to include the treasurer but retain uh, the BOE representation. I have no problem with that. As long as it's clear that if it's amended, for example, and there's agreement to include the treasurer for whatever reasons, uh, that that doesn't mean we take the BOE chair out. That means that I guess they would just increase the number of board members, which I'm okay with that as long as the BOE still has representation on the franchise tax board. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, we don't think that uh, including as amended <coughs> would put the board in a position to agree to any amendment. Obviously, the board would be free to come back and reconsider its position if an amendment 
were to put the treasurer and uh, you know uh, the director of uh, of another department on there, but to the exclusion of the board, the board would certainly be free to take a position to oppose that amendment as well. So I think you could certainly just say opposed now, or the other alternative is you could say opposed unless amended. Uh, and the chair's letter to the legislature could make clear that the board would like to see the, the chair remain on the franchise tax board and any amendment that was contrary to that, the board could certainly reconsider and oppose uh, the amendment as well. Thank you. I'm comfortable with that. Okay, so it uh, sounds like it's acceptable to the maker and the seconder to amend their motion uh, to adopt a position of oppose unless amended to retain the BOE representation on the board is it is it clear I guess more of a legal question here is it clear to say we oppose uh, I guess what is it uh, AB 2338 as proposed but if it was amended as long as it included the BOE chair to, to remain on the franchise tax board we'd be open to it Yes, I think the letter could 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 make it real clear. Clearly convey that the board's position is that the board chair should remain as a member of the franchise tax board. Whatever composition. So an amendment takes. that uh, included that option would likely be acceptable to the board, subject to the board discussing and voting on that. But uh, other amendments uh, might not be, or probably wouldn't be, and the board would need to take a position at that time as well. Sounds good. Okay, and. Um, so we've got a motion and a second to uh, oppose, to adapt a position of oppose unless amended on AB 2238. And the amendment that we would be seeking is to retain uh, the membership of uh, the BOE representative on the franchise tax board. And I, I think that that would be um, an acceptable uh, give to the committee and then it's up to the Rev and Tax Committee to decide if the separate jurisdiction of uh, the state treasurer makes sense for inclusion on the Franchise Tax Board. But I, I think it, it puts us a little bit more uh, into the game and um, what we're attempting to get at is public policy that makes sense and is, is clear and functional for taxpayers and where the taxpayers' interests are uh, represented well. So we've got that, um, that motion and second, and we don't have written commentary on this or anyone in the audience that would like to comment so we can go out to our AT&T moderator. Uh, moderator, if there's anyone who would like to comment on item 12 relative to the Franchise Tax Board uh, membership, if we could hear from them now, please. If you'd like to make a comment, please press one, then zero. And there is no one in queue. Okay, thank you. We'll bring it back to the, the board, and we've got the motion by Mr. Vasquez, seconded by Mr. Gaines. I'll um, take the roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? No. Deputy Controller Emron? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, members. See, I said that was going to be a one-minute item. <laughs> 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 and here we are. Um, we have uh, the executive director's reports up next. Um, did we want to uh, delve into that and, and start it? Or I see Ms. Yeah. Dowers approaching. Ms. Dowers? Oh. She's remote. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, I am available to do my report. My report is going to be brief. As soon as I find my page, um, basically, good, af good, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, good morning. Okay. 
Since we have a full agenda, I'm going to be brief. Um, we do have the Veterans Work Group coming on this afternoon, and they, they have a time start at 1.30, so let me talk. Let me go. Um, I'm going to highlight um, that tomorrow we'll have our annual meeting with Caltex. That is the most important thing coming up for us right now. They would like for the members to be there at 8 o'clock. And after the morning session, um, I will be participating in a leadership with FTB, <laughs> CDTFA, <laughs> and OTA, a panel discussion, update of California Tax Administration and Appeals with Caltex as well. And members, that really concludes my report. Well, where is the 8 o'clock breakfast? It is at the Sheraton. Mm -hmm. Is that the Sheraton? Okay. I do believe that um, your deputy has been in communication with Caltex. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, great. Are any any uh, um, other questions? Any questions? Uh, Ms. Stars, uh, before we leave the executive report, uh, I ask that two matters be under board uh, board member matters, and uh, I'm surprised they're not there. I am anxious to find out uh, what we're going to do about my desire that we, uh, whenever there's changes in our agenda, that we know about within 24 hours of uh, the meeting that we update at least our copies so we know that somebody's not appearing or somebody is appearing or somebody's having a substitute. Uh, 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 I just a request that I think should be honored and uh, uh, you wanted the board's opinion and by putting it on uh, board member matters, we would have had a vote on it. I also am interested that we have a a uh, presumptive 15-minute limit on reports unless there's something that for good cause would run longer like the uh, <clears throat> discussion uh, on the uh, uh, controller's uh, proposal uh, along with member uh, Vasquez. Uh, I can see for longer reports, but I think 15 minutes is a good guide that uh, on any report that's going to come to us. Uh, I think this would make us more efficient and uh, I uh, indicated to you if I couldn't get uh, informal agreement and we really never talk to each other except over lunch <laughs> and uh, uh, could you tell me why I didn't get onto the board member listing and uh, I thought just by sending you an email that would do it uh, um, I mean, I'm willing to fill out form a 23 or whatever is required <laughs> okay thank you you're welcome sir thank you for that question I really appreciate it um, you're entitled to have a board member matter on the agenda. Um, we always send out the draft agenda and provide the deadlines on when a member needs to provide um, a request to have something placed on the agenda. And it's always subject to the chair's approval. I did not receive anything from you indicating that you wanted to have a, this to be a board member ma matter. So if that is your desire, you could place, you could could make the request for the April meeting. Yes, well, I would ask that you put it on the April meeting unless the board uh, can informally agree that uh, we should uh, uh, adopt both see, of these matters. Let me see if I can answer your question because it, maybe it doesn't really need um, board member matter action to be taken. I think um, this is kind of going back to your concerns last month when um, we had a um, our taxpayer rights advocate had an emergency and could not appear, so she had someone speak on her behalf, and you were concerned that um, the name wasn't listed on the agenda. And I also think you had a concern with some of the speakers we had for the informational hearing. And I guess and Ms. Thompson will be with us today. Will she? She's listed. Well, I, she, um, I'm trying to, I was trying to move her up the agenda, um, but let me say this. We do constantly update our agenda, and we do provide the names of the speakers when we know them. And unfortunately, um, for that informational hearing, we did have all the names there. Unfortunately, you did not, your staff didn't give you the most recent agenda. Um, what I have implemented now is that I'm asking, I've asked board proceedings to make sure that a copy of the agenda is placed at the diocese so that every member will have it in front of them. And if there's been any changes on that agenda, go ahead, if we have to just handwrite their names in, they will handwrite their names sure. in. Sure, I'm not asking that all copies be uh, updated. Uh, the public copies go out, you know, 10 days beforehand or so, and uh, they can be uh, 
stale as long as they're not, you know, there's not very much of that. But I'd like to know that what is laid between us that we know about within 24 hours. That's what I, that's why I said, that's why I, we, we do update the agendas sure. on a regular basis. Sure, well, the, I might the have just gotten The gap was that you didn't get a copy of the updated agenda. So my proposal, <coughs> uh, my direction to the team is to make sure that the most recent version of the agenda is placed at the diocese for each member to have in front of them. That's fine, I appreciate it. Okay, that. Mm -hmm. the second question, what it was. Time limit on oh, I, the, I, 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 I think. Oh, the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for the reports, it's, I really believe that's very important that what we're reporting out to you guys on a monthly basis is extremely important as you guys exercise your oversight over this eighty billion dollar property tax. So I, I do not believe that staff report should be limited. I think the more they provide to you guys so that you can exercise your authority, the better. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's been what this board wants. You guys want more. And Go ahead. I see that we have Ms. <laughs> Ms. Himovitz here. Uh, Julia Himovitz on behalf of the legal department. So I just want to make sure that we are staying within um, the boundaries of the agenda as this item is not agendized for now but I do think that the comments have been um, received and the executive director has addressed them uh, as best we can for today but if you'd like to follow up with the executive director uh, please feel free to do so after the meeting yes and and I think in particular what I'm hearing from mr. Schaefer is um, he'd like to put the 15 minute limit on the agenda um, under board member matters um, and and we can try that and um, run it up the flagpole in in April and and see how members feel about that and then I think the the changes to the agenda has has been addressed and um, last month we all received the latest agenda that ended up being the the agenda that was followed um, with some changes in who would be making the presentations about four days before, but sometimes it, it doesn't get to folks. So we have the, now we have the belt and suspenders approach of having it be on the dais as well, which is very, very helpful. So we can, we can agendize the 15 minute limit for April and see where that goes. Thank you. And, um, then uh, I think, uh, is this a good place to cut this off or should we keep on going into item 14? Um, Madam Chair, um, yeah, please. as much as I do wanna have lunch, I, I would like to see if we can take something out of order and have the taxpayer rights advocate um, do her report. She is going to be remotely. Okay. And I do believe she's, she's on right now. Okay, um, and members, this is uh, item 16, and Ms. Thompson will um, be here virtually presenting her report. Ms. Thompson. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Chair Lieber and honorable board members. I'm Lisa Thompson, the Chief of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office, and I'm here to provide you an update on the activities of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office to keep you informed. Um, First, some statistics on the number of completed cases in February. The TRA office completed uh, 38 cases. 11 were in Vice Chair Gaines's district, District 1. Seven in Chair Lieber's district, District 2. Eight were in Board Member Vasquez's district, District 3. And 12 were in Member Schaefer's district, District 4. Mm. Eight of those uh, were in the administrative category with 30 from the valuation category. And the memo attached to the uh, public agenda notice identifies all of the topics um, for those completed cases. However, the largest topic within the valuation category was exclusions from reassessment with 13 completed cases. Of those 13 exclusion cases, eight were from base year value transfers and uh, five were, excuse me, um, of those 13, eight were from parent child and the remaining were from base year value transfers. The next highest percentage was exemptions at uh, seven, with the majority of those being for the welfare exemption. Um, 
I also uh, wanted to briefly address some of the questions from last month's board meeting um, that uh, in regards to the TRA annual report. Vice Chair K Gaines indicated that the pie charts in the annual reports were uh, effective in showing the percentages by topic and asked if it was possible for us to include some uh, charts in the TRA annual report by district. Um, and uh, Board Member Vasquez and Deputy Controller Enron also expressed interest in having that breakdown by district and Chair Lieber reiterated that having that uh, the type of cases by district um, included in the annual report would be useful. So I have asked a member of my team to start compiling that information and we will be including those additional charts in the uh, next year's annual report. Um, we will work with the uh, our service provider to best um, illustrate um, how that information is presented in the 23-24 annual report. Next, I wanted to address Deputy Controller's Enron comment, Enron's comment about submitting the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office annual report to the governor. Unlike the agency's annual report, which must be submitted to the governor, the Taxpayer Rights Advocate annual report is addressed to the agency's executive director, Ms. Stowers. Um, and as the agency's taxpayer rights advocate, I am mandated under the Property Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, to annual report to the executive director under Revenue and Taxation Code Section 5904. However, I wanted to note that the agency's annual report does include a section on the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office in it, and uh, it also includes a link to our agency, or, to the um, annual report for the TRA office in that agency's annual report, as well as a link to the TRA office's web page. Finally, I wanted to thank the board for its support and recognizing the importance of the TRA office's um, help to taxpayers. And now that the Taxpayer Rights Advocate annual report has been issued, my team and I are preparing for the upcoming Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. That concludes my update. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, okay, Ms. Uh, Comment, if I could. Mr. Gaines. Just, I, I wanted to thank uh, Lisa Thompson for her report. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for taking the input for our next annual report in terms of just putting into a pie chart the nature of the inquiries that are coming from each of our districts. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schaefer. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I want to thank you for a very uh, good report today and appreciate the fine work you're doing. Uh, could I ask how come you're virtual today? Are you uh, out of town? I always enjoy your smiling personality when you're here. Excuse me, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we we can't go there. We don't go there. It's not yeah, going to happen. Can, I can just answer it. <laughs> I, I, I don't mind. So um, I, if I was able to be there, I would have. Um, but I had medical appointment this morning, so. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I continue to suggest that when we can, we incorporate by reference uh, a certain item rather than printed verbatim. I'm talking about the 30 pages of uh, revenue or 20 pages of uh, revenue and taxation code. Uh, I'd sort of like to see uh, our taxpayers' report be about the same size as the board's annual report or, or, or smaller. And... Uh, I would like to see us incorporate by reference stuff that people can look up uh, rather than feel an obligation to provide verbatim copies of statutes which are readily available to everybody online. And also I'd like to request that your annual report, which is always a quality product, uh, have uh, Peter Kim, our communications director, uh, 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 overview it also. Uh, I was complimenting him on the very fine part change pie charts that uh, you had in your last report and he had not been involved in it. So I guess I thank you and not him for, for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we do, so the reason we include the append in the appendix is we do include the Taxpayer Bill of Rights laws 
um, for property taxes and as well as the alcoholic beverage tax. It shows the laws in effect at the time of that fiscal year of the report. Um, we want our taxpayers to be able to easily see what the protections and rights are uh, under the law at that point in time without having them have to search for the information. Uh, it is challenging for many taxpayers to find information on uh, the legislative um, California Legislative Information website. Um, and so we kind of want to have a one stop shop for our taxpayers. It provides for transparency. Um, and also generally we we don't really print the annual report. We print um, some handful of copies, you know, for the board members offices as well as uh, our internal staff. Um, and also to provide um, to a taxpayer um, if they for some reason don't have access to the internet we do uh, mail a copy to them so well, I, I would respond um, that that was the right answer 30 hand. years ago when nobody had a computer but today every taxpayer has a computer and they can push a button and get the same copy so that's really the reason I, i'm uh, being so space age on this thank you thank you okay um, and I, I just, my only comments would be, uh, I really enjoyed the report. I thought it was very clear and comprehensive. And uh, maybe it's the fact that I live in the super wonky Bay Area and people do appreciate reading the current state of the statutes and um, having that at hand to grasp a hold of. And I think that our focus always does need to be on how can we serve the taxpayer uh, the best and, and have that uh, online available to them. So um, my kudos to all of your staff that were involved in the preparation of the report. I thought it was very well done. And, and I'm glad that we're doing that annually um, because it is a good uh, place setter for us with the taxpayers who are very interested in it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Lieber. Appreciate it. Okay, and um, seeing no further uh, questions on this one, um, thank you, Ms. Thompson, uh, for your report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have, uh, did we wanna take the, the extension of time to okay. complete? Uh, local assessment role okay. from Ms. Towers. Right. You can learn a little bit more about San Luis Obispo. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the. Uh, members of Revenue and Taxation Code 616 requires the county assessors to annually complete their local assessment role by July 1st. Section 155 provides that the board or the executive director may extend by 30 days the deadline for any official act by the assessor. In the case of a calamity, the deadline may be extended by 40 days. Section 155 also requires that the executive director inform the board of any such extensions at its next regular meeting. This report is to inform you that St. Louis Obispo County Assessor has requested and has been granted a 30-day extension for completing, for completing their 2024 local assessment role. Any questions? Any questions, members? Uh, okay, seeing none, thank you so much for that report, um, Ms. Towers. And uh, shall we keep forging ahead? Is it close to us? We should probably take lunch now. Yes, I would okay. say we take lunch. Great, I think it's a fantastic time to take lunch at 12.44 and we will come back at 1.44 and, and I trust that Mr. Vasquez's staff can update the speakers who are expecting to be on at 1.30 and, and let them know that we're gonna be a little bit delayed there. So thank you so much members. Mm -hmm.